Bucknutters, welcome to the Bucknuts Morning Five here on Monday, March 25th, 2019. I am Dave Biddle, very happy to be joined by Bill Bank Green. Bank, uh, Blue Smith left the program. Uh, well, we reported it on Friday. It happened, obviously, a few days before that. Um, just your reaction. You hate to see a kid that's this talented, you know, leave the program. I thought at first maybe when he quit, he would maybe pull a Chris Fields and, come, and apologize and come back. That's not happening. Just your reaction to Blue Smith leaving the program. Yeah, I don't know, Dave. I mean, it almost seemed like a marriage that was set for problems right from the get-go. I mean, Blue, I mean, was adamant that he was not going to play tight end. And Ohio State recruited him, and they were like, yeah, 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 you're a wide receiver with us. But I, I think all along, I think they saw him as that flex tight end. And I think they thought, well, we'll just get him in here, and then he'll see the light, and he'll come around to our way of thinking. And Well, he never did. He wants to play wide receiver. Well, at wide receiver, you are behind Austin Mack, Ben Victor, Jalen Harris. You know, uh, he may have been behind Elijah Gardner. And then that doesn't even account the guys that played last year, Johnny Dixon, Terry McLaurin. I mean, he's just buried, you know. And now you're bringing in Garrett Wilson. And, you know, Hartline's looking to make a haul this year with a bunch of outside guys. And it's like, you got a problem, Blue, you know. I mean, and it's it's just – I'm not saying he can't play wide receiver in the right system, but I think in this system – you know, once they went from Urban to Ryan Day, that just increases the, the thought that Blue's going to be that flex tight end type of guy. It's not what he wanted to do. So, you know, it, this one was probably headed here from the day he committed unless somebody gave in on how they viewed, you know, where, where, where the players should play. I read what you wrote. You think he's probably going to head to Cincinnati here, if you had to guess, play for Fickle? Well, Kentucky was like the the school I thought he would go to because they were like the second choice coming out of high school. But from people I've talked to over the weekend, I mean, it sure seems like UC is probably going to be that destination. You know, looking at the current crop of wide receiver, you mentioned a lot of these guys. I mean, I feel like um, – yeah, I feel bad for Blue. I mean, we uh, – he's a nice kid, um, knows his family a little bit. He, uh, he's a you know, one of our, great our kid. Staff. Yeah, one of our staff members is very close with his family. So um, he is a really good kid. I wish him well. As we look at Ohio State's wide receiving core, I mean, maybe it'll hurt them in the future. I don't think it's going to hurt them at all this year. Cause I didn't really have Blue Smith penciled in to play much this year. Like, I'll, I'll be honest, I didn't play in, like, at all in, in like, meaning, like, like actual meaningful moments. I mean, they're pretty – they're not loaded, but they have, you have the four seniors coming back with you – know, you mentioned – you know, Austin Mack and Ben Victor, they got K.J. Hill, they got C.J. Saunders. I mean, Chris Olave's a rising star. Everybody I talked to over there at the WAC loves him. It's easy to see. He tore up the Michigan game. Jalen, Jalen Harris is a player on the rise. You mentioned him. Um, there's some other guys you mentioned, like Elijah Gardner. They got in there. They got a walk-on they like in Garrett Prater, um, Garrett Wilson. As you look at this wide receiving core, especially with Ryan Day operating a, you know, more of a pass-happy offense, what, what, you know, what, what comes to mind when you think of this wide receiving group? Well, I, I like those guys. They're all big, long, rangy, possession-type guys. The only thing that would concern me would be the speed that walked out the door. You know, Paris, you're not going to get another guy like Paris. I don't care. I mean, right. it wasn't just his 40 time, which is unbelievable. You know, you saw that at the Combine. It was the fact that he was at top speed after one step. You know, a 40 time is great, but if that 40 time really gets achieved in the final 20 yards instead of the first 10 yards, it's kind of deceiving. With Paris, he was at top speed like now. Catch the ball and it was instant separation. He didn't need 40 yards to separate. He separated in four yards. And then McLaurin could fly. Johnny Dixon, once he got healthy, could fly. And I don't see Mack and Victor – and Harris, I don't see those guys having that kind of speed. KJ Hill's he's fast, you know, but he's not Paris. So that would be the only thing, and that would be where you probably will see Demario McCall on that slot. You know, Jalen Gill, I think, fits in here. So in terms of, like, dependable, solid pass catchers, guys that are matchup problems in, like, the red zone and, you know, in the first down area, I love the guys they have coming back. You know, to me, Victor's the wild card. You know, you always keep waiting on the potential to match, you know, production to match potential. And it hasn't yet, but, boy, you see glimpses 
Yeah, you go back to that Penn State game last year, and that play that he made there was was unbelievable. I mean, that was an NFL, a high level NFL play, but you just don't see it, you know, on a quarter to quarter basis, you know. So that that's he's probably the big key for them. If if Ben Victor can just raise his level just a little bit, I mean, that's pretty scary then with Austin Mack. So I like the receiving core. I think they're very dependable, very solid, very consistent. I just, you know, like I said, I just wonder when you subtract a lot of the speed out of there, you know, how's that going to affect this season? Let's switch some gears and talk some recruiting bank. Um, Buckeyes are already doing a great job O-line recruiting the 2020 class. I mean, they got to hang on to Paris Johnson. That's the most obvious thing ever, but um, I'm confident they will. Um, start with that. Before I ask you about some of the other guys, um, just uh, are you confident they'll hang on to Paris Johnson in this class? I feel pretty good about that. I mean, I think at the end of the day, I think Ohio State still has the real-life Wednesday program. Um, everything that his mother liked about Ohio State is still there without Urban. Um, so, you know, without knowing specifically, you know, Paris and his mom, how they looked at Urban Meyer, I mean, if it's strictly from – the fact that he won 91% of his games, then Ryan Day is going to have to win. But, you know, if it was just they knew Urban well, they connected with him, then, you know, as Ryan Day spends more time with Paris and his mom, I think Ryan is so personable and, and so likable that I think that can be, can be, can be you know, crossed. And, you know, I, I fully expect Paris to take five visits next fall. And I think this is this drama – um, it's probably going to go on for a while. And I think the good thing was that, you know, when Urban left, I think it was a jolt to the mom and to the player, but he didn't, com- he didn't decommit, which he could have, you know, he could have just said, look, still love you guys, still considering you guys, but this has really set me back a little bit. You know, the fact that Urban retired, I want to take a step back. I want to reevaluate everything. Still going to consider you guys. Well, he didn't do that. He stayed committed. Now, you watch him every week show up on a different campus and, you know, put on Twitter how he's all in for that school, how he loves that school. You know, I know it's unnerving for fans. Um, But I think at the end of the day, I think when Ryan Day, you know, develops that relationship with the family just a little bit further and it gets a little stronger, I think, you know, I think at some point, either next February or next December, you're going to see Paris sign with Ohio State. I don't think there's any point of panic right now. Look at the rest of O-line recruiting. What stands out when you look at this 2020 class and the guys that the Buckeyes are going after? Well, they needed numbers, number one. I mean, they could not fall short in terms of quantity. They had to get five for sure, which that's a certainty right now. And, you know, six I think would be ideal. And I think they're looking at six if, you know, it ends up being the right six. Um, Whipler is, you know, he's not Harry Miller, but he's close. So you got a monster inside guy there. Paris to me is, you know, the best O-line prospect I've seen in Ohio since Mike Adams. And I like him better than Mike Adams. So those two were just, you know, those are, those are clutch. Jacob James would be a guy that we have rated higher 24-7 24-7 than anyone else does, and that's because of me and because I just keep pounding the table and banging that drum. I mean, I love Jacob James as a player. Um, not sure he's a four-star, but he's a, a solid high three-star, and I think he's got the feet to play tackle, but he could play guard, too, if you need him to. So I like his position versatility. I like the fact that he's been raised to be an O-lineman, in a family full of O-line, and his dad's an O-line coach at Elder. Then you get to Trey LaRue, and Trey is one that, you know, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that I think he's, you know, an All-American, but he is a Big Ten bona fide 100% recruit. He is not a MAC recruit, as some people have referred to him. That is not accurate, okay? Trey is, a, without question, a Big Ten football player. And at the end of this class, If you walk out of there next February with Trey LaRue as your number six guy, that's fine. 
Clemson takes guys like that all the time. Alabama, you know, nobody gets all four and five star kids. Okay. Trey is a great kid. Number one. So if I'm going to take me a project, I'm not taking somebody that's questionable in grades or character. Trey's not that. And Trey's got size. So if you're going to miss, let's miss on size. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, if you've got Trey as your number one or number two or three recruit in the class, um, I would question the overall talent of that class. If he's your sixth guy, you know, and you end up grabbing Michael Carmody from this weekend and then fill in with another guy later, you know, man, I, you can't get much better than that. So improving the quantity, I think, was number one, getting five or six. And, of course, you want quality. So, you know, and I'm a guy that's as hard on O line stuff as anyone. You know, I'm right there with Dwayne Long. But I like what they're doing. And so, you know, no, no argument for me here. Yeah, count me in too. I, I love what they're doing. I love stocking up on the on, on the biggins inside, um, or on the line, I should say, not just inside. Um, all right, let's. Uh, I want to ask you about Henry Gray, the 2020 corner, big time prospect. He's not a five star, but he's a high four star kid, rating over 96 percent on the 24 uh, seven Sports Composite. He's ranked as the number six corner in the country, number 70 overall player in the country. Uh, again, a corner out of Miami, Florida. Henry Gray. What's the latest with him as it pertains to the Buckeyes Bank? He's on campus, you know, and, and the key thing here that differentiates there, – there's a couple of things that differentiate this recruitment from Jordan Battles, which is a good thing for Ohio State. Battle last year took the official visit at this time. And then you, you worried at that, that will we ever see him again? You know, when he takes that official, he burns it early. He committed, love fest, everything's good. They never saw him again. Okay, he was always supposed to come to a game, never did. With this visit, this is an unofficial visit. So Henry and Ohio State still have that official visit in their back pocket so that whether, no matter what happens on this weekend, which, and from what I'm told, it's going really, really well. And the key here is really mom more than Henry on this trip. And like I say, this is going really well for Ohio State. I'll know more when this visit's completed, but so far, the early returns are great. And, and the nice thing here is you're going to get him back again, okay, for that official. You're guaranteed that he's coming back and with mom a second time. That did not happen with battle. They hoped it would happen. It never did. That's why I like this visit. And this is also a four-day visit. This was not a 24-hour a shot up to Ohio State, and then we're going to shoot to Michigan and then over to Notre Dame. That's a lot of Florida kids do that. That didn't happen on this one. This is four days at Ohio State. So I'm not sure he's going to come out of here committed to Ohio State, but I think they're going to be the clear leader. And then you've got that official visit in your back pocket. You wait for the right time to get he and his mom back up here, probably for a game day, you know, and then, then you cement that thing and you lock it in. So that's the key difference between Henry Gray's recruitment and Jordan Battle's recruitment is the extra visit. And I like where this one's progressing. If you like it, I like it. Great stuff, as always, from Bill Bank Green. I appreciate it, Bank, and appreciate all the listeners out there for tuning in to the show. I hope everyone has a great day. Let's hear that Buckeye swag, best in band in the land. (laughs) 